Hello, in this podcast, we're going to be learning about how we get energy from the Earth. And our learning targets for this podcast are to describe how we get energy from wind, water, and geothermal. And also to list the advantages and disadvantages for all of these three methods. First, we learn about energy from water. And the energy comes from flowing or falling water. This flowing or falling water makes electricity by turning turbines, which powers a generator and that produces electricity. A variety of methods of producing this. One is hydropower. Hydropower basically is using the water flowing downhill. And there's tidal power, which is using the energy from water being moved by the tides. Wave power is using the energy that's found in ocean waves. First, hydropower. Hydropower comes from building a dam across a large river, and that creates a reservoir behind it. The picture that we have over here is of one of the largest, if not the largest one in the world, and this is Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China. And that has created a reservoir where it's flooded three gorges or three or three canyons behind it. And they had to move a lot of people, do their best to preserve a lot of historical sites by moving the sites themselves. And there's a huge reservoir behind it. In the United States, we have other dams like Hoover Dam, which produces a huge reservoir behind it. And also the Glen Canyon Dam has flooded the Glen Canyon, producing Lake Powell and that is in the state of Utah. You see over here in this picture is you notice how there's a reservoir behind and off to the side, you don't you can see this here, but there's, there's some locks where ships can go through. And you see how there's water coming out of four pipes that I see there. And the water coming out of there are, before they come out, they turn turbines and that produces electricity. Now 16% of the world's electricity is hydropower. In the United States, it's 7% altogether. It's 50% of the electricity on the West Coast produced by such dams as the Glen Canyon Dam and also Hoover Dam and a few others. You also get some hydropower here in New York. That's from the hydropower plant at Niagara Falls. Hydropower has advantages and disadvantages, and there are quite a few of both of them. First, let's go over the advantages. There is medium to high net energy. It's very efficient, about 80%. When it's running, it's very inexpensive to run. There's no refueling. You just let the water go through the pipes and turning it on and off and just maintenance of it. In temperate climates, there's no carbon dioxide emissions at all. Some negatives that we're seeing the disadvantages can be avoided by using micro hydropower generators. And in this case, rather than putting a dam across the river, the turbines are placed in the river itself without damming it and the flow of the river turns the turbines so that the stream isn't altered and the negatives that we're going to get into in a moment you're not going to see. The dams have a very long lifespan. There also is flood control downstream. For example, in Egypt, the Aswan Dam across the Nile has basically stopped annual flooding of the Nile River downstream. And also it's very useful for irrigation too. The reservoir itself can be used for recreation and fishing. The Powell is used for on the site of where the Glen Canyon Dam is underneath Lake Powell. Disadvantages, well, construction is very expensive. In some cases, like with the Three Gorges Dam, it took years to build the whole thing. There is a large environmental impact from flooding the land to create the reservoir. These costs are not included in the price. The area that is flooded, all those ecosystems are completely destroyed and replaced with the lake ecosystem. And getting to some things further down on the list, people do get uprooted. Any towns, any villages, any cities that are on a site which turns into a reservoir, and, and generally people live along rivers, and if those rivers then get flooded from reservoir, those people will have to move. When they built the Three Gorges Dam, they literally had to move cities. When these reservoirs are in tropical areas instead of temperate areas, and if they're shallow rather than deep, there's quite a bit of biomass decay and that will produce high CO2 emissions. There's also danger of collapse of the dam that can produce massive flooding downstream. Also the landslide and earthquakes. The way you get landslides and earthquakes with the formation of the reservoir, the amount of groundwater greatly increases. And what that can sometimes do in terms of landslides, and this happened in Italy, is that it can reduce the friction holding the ground in place. It can cause a landslide going into the reservoir, and that happened in Italy. The dam actually held, but the water overtopped the dam, and the flood flooded out several villages downstream and killed many, many people. What happens with earthquakes is that the water goes down and it reaches faults. It can decrease the friction, and that will increase the probabilities of there being earthquakes. Also, there'll be fewer fish below the dam. 
And when the river is dammed, what that does is it stops the flow of the water. When the water isn't flowing, it can't carry as much as it did before, or it won't carry anything at all. So all of the silt that it was carrying just drops into the bottom of the reservoir. So that silt won't go further downstream. And it's going to slowly fill up the reservoir that decreased the life of the, of the reservoir itself and the hydroelectric power. And also the silt won't be deposited further downstream, and that will do things like increase the rate of erosion and decrease the fertility of the land because the silt itself is very high in nutrients usually. Okay, now we come to tidal power. There are basically two methods of tidal power. One method is very popular in Europe and places like the Netherlands, and there dams are placed across the mouth of the bay or estuary. When the water comes in during high tide, they basically close the gates. So the dam is open from low tide to high tide, lets all the water in, then the gates are closed. That produces a temporary reservoir behind the dam. And during low tide, the water then will flow out and turn into turbines. The second method is one that is being prototyped uh, in New York City in both the East River and also by Roosevelt Island. And you see it over here pictured here where two of the turbines are in the process of being put into place it's in the East River. The bridge you see there is the 59th Street Bridge. These turbines are placed on the floor of the East River and they swivel depending on what direction the tides are going in the East River, which really is a tidal strait, it's not an actual river. The river is actually a body of fresh water and there's only one freshwater river in New York City and it's not the Hudson. The Hudson River ends at Poughkeepsie, it's not the East River, it's not the Harlem River, it's just the Bronx River. Now, these methods are limited primarily by the lack of suitable sites. You need to have a place where the flow of water is strong enough, in the case of the swiveling turbines, or the difference between high tide and low tide is high enough in the case of the first method. There can be quite a bit of damage due to coastal storms. Also, since the water is salty, there's high amounts of corrosion, and there's also high costs associated with this method. Then we come to wave power. Now, waves have a tremendous amount of energy, and you can just see this anytime when you go to the beach. And there are several methods involved in capturing this wave power. And I have two methods pictured over here. One method is using something that looks like a snake. As the waves move, it moves parts of the snake up and down. There are pumps inside of it, and moving it up and down will move those pumps, and that will pump hydraulic fluid. Those hydraulic fluid will then turn turbines, and that produces the electricity. Second method is pictured down over here. This method, the waves move pumps. These pumps pump the water up onto land, where they have the option, if the area is dry, to desalinate it to make fresh water. And regardless, when the water is pumped up, now you can have water flowing downhill, and that water flowing downhill turns the turbine, producing electricity. Now we come to wind power, and you see a wind farm pictured over here. Just as water directly turns the turbines, wind also directly turns the turbines, and that produces electricity. And we have great potential for producing wind electricity in the United States. Where there's a sufficient amount of wind, you can have wind electricity. In the Great Plains, are called the Saudi Arabia of wind power, because if enough wind farms are placed here, they could potentially produce three times the amount of electricity as all of the United States power plants that are around today. To get that, we have to make the wind farms, and we would also have to produce the electrical infrastructure to bring the electricity from the wind farms to places around the country. Also, wind farms can be placed offshore. The number of these farms are increasing because offshore the winds are stronger than they are onshore. Now, even when you include the environmental costs, wind power is the cheapest and the least polluting way to produce electricity. One of the environmental costs mainly are that wind turbines will kill things that fly into it, like birds and bats, and about 40,000 of them are killed per year. It's not as bad as it seems because most of these are killed from the older turbines, and when you look at it in perspective, it's profoundly less than, than those that are killed by other methods. Like over a billion of those are killed by electric transmission towers, 100 million are killed by cats. That's one reason why, if you have a cat, it's really a very, very bad idea to let your cat outdoors because your cats will kill birds. Also, hunters kill over 100 million every year. 
cars and trucks kill 50 to 100 million of birds every year. In coastal and populated areas, we have a situation called NIMBY, which means not in my backyard. Like people who live on the coast, they don't want to see wind turbines when they look out to sea, and it is um, an eyesore for them. But on the other hand, on farms and ranches, you've got a case of PIMBY, which is put in my backyard. The reason why they want these things is because the farmers and ranchers can receive three thousand to ten thousand dollars per year per turbine and the land can still be used for crops and grazing even though many of them decide not to do it and many of them go into business themselves in terms of wind farms where they own it rather than leasing it. Advantages and disadvantages. Well, advantages are there's medium to high net energy yield it's a highly efficient method. There's a medium cost to building it, but it's once it's built, electricity is very, very cheap. And there's an extremely low impact on the environment. There are absolutely no carbon dioxide emissions during the use of it, but there is, of course, emissions when it's made. But it is quickly made and it is easily made. The land where the turbines are situated can be used for other things. You can still grow crops in the land where the turbines are. You can still graze your cattle in the land where the turbines are. You are also able to have a wind turbine in your backyard if you want to. Just like you can have a your roofs having solar panels on it, you can put a wind turbine in, in your backyard or your front yard, have that hooked up. There also are incentives for building these and you just need to have the wind. Any electricity you're not using gets sold to the power plant. So your power meter will be running backwards. Disadvantages to wind power. Steady winds are needed. I think you need at least in like an average of 12 mile per hour winds in order to have a wind turbine really usable for your home. Also, backups are needed when the winds die, just like is needed for solar power when it's nighttime. Usually for that, you use things like batteries or something like that. The plastic parts are made from oil. So there's CO2 emissions in terms of the oil and also in terms of manufacturing it, it's, it itself. And these environmental costs are not included at all in the market price. Wind farms do use a lot of land, even though you can use that land for other things. It is an eyesore. The turning of the turbines is noisy. As it went before, the turbines do kill birds and bats, and they do interfere with migratory birds. Now we come to geothermal heat. Geothermal heat uses the heat difference between the Earth's surface and the underground to heat and cool the house. Because when you get far enough underground, the underground is at a constant temperature year-round. And it's basically a huge storage of the heat that comes from the sun, even though it's a constant heat. So that means that in the winter, we can take that heat from underground. You see over here, basically, there are pipes that lead underground it can be horizontal or it can be vertical. So during the winter, the fluid that flows through the pipes that go underground, and this fluid usually is a mixture of water and antifreeze. Fluid will then absorb the heat from underground, then it reaches the compressor in the house. And that compressor compresses that water, and when that water gets compressed, it gets heated up. And then the air that flows past it, or the water from the water heater that flows past it, that heat is then transferred to the air or into that water. That air will then heat up the house and then the fluid which has now lost its heat then expands and as it expands it cools and it goes back underground to absorb more heat underground. During the summer this whole thing is reversed. What happens here is that the fluid then will absorb heat from the air that is returning as it absorbs that heat. That air gets cooled and that cooled air cools off the house and then that fluid gets compressed and that will heat up that fluid even more and then that fluid then goes underground where it's now hotter than the surrounding ground since it's hotter it then gives up that heat to the ground and then that cooler liquid then goes back up to the compressor where since it's running in reverse now that liquid gets expanded and as it expands it cools off and we're back to where we began in the cycle, where since cooled off, it now is able to absorb the heat from the returning air. With super insulation, geothermal heat is the most energy efficient, reliable, and least polluting and cost efficient way to heat your home. 
Uh, the only thing that needs electricity here is the compressor and the pump and does use a lot of electricity and it's fairly quiet. Now we come to geothermal energy. Geothermal heat can be used anywhere. Geothermal energy can only be used in certain places where there's very hot water relatively close to the surface. And these reservoirs of hot water are used to produce the electricity. Pretty much what happens is that this hot water is pumped up to the surface where it exchanges the heat to other water. That water is boiled and produces steam and the steam turns the turbines producing electricity. Get back to this water over here that came from underground. It's now cooler from exchanging the heat and that is then pumped back down underground to make the resource renewable so that we don't run out of water underground there. However, if, if the rate of taking water out is much too quickly, then this renewable resource then becomes a non-renewable resource. About half of the geothermal electricity in the world is produced by the United States and by the Philippines, and it does have emissions of greenhouse gases. It releases a sixth of the carbon dioxide as an actual gas plant and a tenth as a coal plant. Now you may wonder from this, do you end up with emissions of carbon dioxide and actually get don't just get emissions of carbon dioxide, there's also emissions of other greenhouse gases like methane. These gases come up in the liquid itself. They are dissolved in the liquid underground and when they come up to the surface, they come out of solution and then go up into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide doesn't come from burning, it comes from out of the solution in the water. Advantages and disadvantages. Well, the advantages are it's very highly efficient. And at favorable site, medium net energy, there's lower carbon dioxide emissions than fossil fuels, there's low cost and low land use. And once again, the favorable sites are places where there's very hot water relatively close to the surface. You'll find this near volcanoes, you'll find this in hot spots, like Iceland has a lot of geothermal energy. Disadvantages. There are very few of these suitable sites. The energy will be depleted if it's used too rapidly. Environmental costs, just like almost everything else are not included in the price. There are greenhouse gas emissions. There is local air pollution from this and there is noise and there is odor. And the odor comes from hydrogen sulfide, uh, which is also dissolved in the water. At unfavorable sites, there is high cost because you have to dig much, much deeper in order to get to the hot water. Now we come to our concluding questions. And for all of these, you have to describe and list one advantage and one disadvantage for number one, electricity from water, number two, wind power, number three, geothermal heat, and number four, geothermal electricity. That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.